Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. Welcome to Steamboat Rock Baptist Church. Boy, am I glad to see all of you here with us this morning. Moms, happy Mother's Day. Vince will tell you, but we got carnations out in the lobby that are just for you. So if you want one, grab one on your way out, out this morning. Well, hey, and for uh, Mother's Day and its commencement Sunday for a lot of the schools around here, uh, to just commemorate what God's done through moms, we've got a youth worship team up here with us. Now, most of these students... On Wednesday nights, they'll be upstairs with us at Radiate, helping lead their peers in worship. But for Mother's Day, they're down here helping us uh, do our music this morning. <clears throat> um, and so with that, I wanted to say, oh, that's what I was going to say. Almost forgot. One of the things, and if you've been around here a lot, you, you just kind of know this about our church. It's just one of the foundational things, the heartbeat of who we are, is to launch the next generation. To launch, that's why we do Awana the way we do it. That's why we do uh, Radiate Student Ministries. That's why we do Pathways classes the way we do it. That's why we do stuff like this, because this generation is the one that's going to carry the faith forward for years to come. And it even says in Psalm 89, this is the very first, first verse. It says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faith, faithfulness known through all generations. Not just the last generation, not just this generation, that one too, and all the ones going forward, going to know the faithfulness of the Lord. And so as, as they sing and as they lead us, I'm going to invite you to stand and ask that you would sing along and praise God with us for everything that he's doing here.
going to take a minute. We're going to swap out drummers. One of the neat things uh, that's continuing just to like launch the next generation is Nolan, the guy on the bass today, has been training up some young drummers, and we've got him up here uh, swapping out on some songs with us. So uh, it's like I say, it's a way that we're launching the next generation, getting them trained up to lead worship. This is amazing grace. 
as we're making our last drummer transition, uh, we're going to sing one more song together this morning. Uh, and it's probably pretty familiar. It's a song called Waymaker. And besides just being a good song that's true about who God is, it's, it's actually pretty specific to what Pastor Harrison's going to be uh, preaching on this morning, that amidst what can seem like uh, hopeless and very challenging situations, what our God does is he, is he makes a way. It's not always like a really clear way to us, but it is God's gracious and merciful way time and time again. So we get to sing that together uh, this morning before we hear about it from his word. see what God's doing. We can believe that he's still at work. Let's sing this together. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. One more time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. That is who you are. That is who 
something that God's been so gracious to our church is this is a church of lots of families, a lot of youth, and God is at work in all those youth. So as we kind of end our time, because they did a great job and because God is so good, can we just give them a round of applause for their service this morning? Awesome. All right, hey, you guys can take your seats. Thank you for singing along. Well, good morning on this Mother's Day. We're so glad that you uh, decided to worship with us, and uh, we know that there's a lot of things you can be doing on a Sunday, and so we're just glad that you carved out a little bit of time for the Lord and for His people. He's gone that way. Um, so we're just so glad that you're here, and there are flowers um, outside of the sanctuary, so as you're leaving, uh, gentlemen, kids, snag one of those, and then I would also say if you're milling about and you start to see the church is getting emptier and emptier, and there's still flowers there, free game, take them, okay? Uh, we don't know what we're going to do with them if they're still there. So uh, some of you, if you hang around a little bit, you'll get more than one flower. Um, and some of you brought a lot of grandkids, and so you're going to go at home with a bouquet anyway. So uh, we're just so excited uh, for this Mother's Day, and we just hope that uh, you all feel appreciated and celebrated um, because we know God moves through mothers, and he um, does a lot through the moms in our congregation. Well, uh, we're about a month away from uh, Go Day, which is June 10th, and we'll be in Eldora on the square, and we will be blessing the community. And we've got uh, a really unique uh, opportunity this year as we looked at our vision of renewing rural Iowa. We saw an opportunity to empower our community uh, through partnering with a lot of different organizations. And so uh, we've got a video with some more details about what that day is going to look like and who we're partnering with. My name is Nicole, and I'm one of the directors of the Eldora Community Garden here in Eldora, Iowa. We are a food donation site um, growing uh, food for the food shelf and for the community to take during our open hours. And we're really excited for Steamboat Rock to be partnering with us for this Go Day. And uh, hope that you guys are willing to come out and help us pull some weeds. So hope that you guys can make it. My name's Michaela and I work with LifeServe Blood Center. And I hope to see you at Go Day in Eldora, Saturday, June 10th. Did you know that one in seven patients who walk through the hospital end up needing a blood transfusion? So donating blood is a great way to give back to your community and I hope that you can be a part of it. Hi there, I'm Kathy Sutton and I want to encourage you to come spend some time with us on our Go Day project here at the Mobile Home Park at the Little Rock Ministry Trailer. We're going to be um, tearing out our floor and replacing that as well as just some spring cleanup inside and out. So June 10th, come join us. Hi, I'm Bonnie Holiday, and I am with the Hardin County Iowa Helps Warehouse. We are a nonprofit charitable warehouse. Everything you see here is has been donated to us. Um, we are open on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 until 5 p.m. And we take donations between 2 and 3 um, to make it easier for people to come in and go out. We are also open on Sundays from 3 till 4 um, for donations only. Like I said, we are a nonprofit. Um, and everything in here you see is free and everything in here has been donated. Welcome to Pine Lake Food Shelf. We are located here in Eldora, Iowa. We serve the community and the family members of Eldora, New Providence, and Steamboat Rock. We are located in the basement of the Hardin County office building, just kitty corner from Sunshine Cafe. And we're open Mondays and Wednesdays from 1.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and if you'd like to make a donation, um, we would appreciate any donations, non-perishable food items or um, cash or um, a check made out to Pine Lake Food Shelf. We thank you for your support. So as you can see there at the end, we, uh, we're going to be having a lunch that will be happening on the square as well as all the uh, different projects and, and opportunities to help uh, the, lo our local organizations. Um, and there are four to five different ways that you can get lunch. Uh, 
you could show up and just give us $5, and we'd be pretty stoked about that. And uh, that would just go to help cover the, the cost of the food. And uh, we'd be excited to have you come down and, and talk to other people who are milling about, maybe share the gospel, your testimony. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. Or you could donate blood if that's your thing. That, that's, uh, those times are going to be 7.30 to 11.30. Yep, yep. And uh, so you can do that. You could donate some food items to the Pan Lake Food Shelf. You could donate some home goods to the, the warehouse. Or you could just donate your time. And we'll send you off to Little Rock Ministries or to the community garden or to the warehouse to help them organize and, and clean their, sh their, uh, their place. And so uh, those are all valid options to come and, and get some food. And uh, we'd love for you to do that. When you do those things, we'll, we'll give you kind of like a little meal ticket and you'll be able to come and get, get some lunch for that. Uh, we got signups that are open, like Rodney said. Uh, one is down by the Welcome Center past the photo booth, and uh, you can sign that one physically, or you can sign up on our website on our Go page, and uh, we'd love for you to do that. And if you're thinking, I'm busy, or I'm going to be in Israel, or I'm too old to be doing that, um, you are not too old, I'll say that. Um, but we'd, we'd love your prayers as well. This is a big opportunity for us to be downtown and to be sharing what the good news is and how it affects not only our eternal life, but our temporal life as well. And so we'd love for you to, to join us in prayer and then and consider those ways that you could help us out as well. We'd love it if you could stand and greet those around you. Okay, kids, you can make your way to Children's Church. It's great to have the youth leading us in worship. And um, what, you, what you didn't know is that our soundboard that makes all this go, it decided to go out on Monday. Um, yeah, it, it was black. John was asking, did anybody shut off the soundboard? Because there's a certain way you shut it down, and nobody was owning up to it. And then... Uh, we realized, no, the soundboard shut itself down for the last time. And, and so that took a while to figure that out and then to get a new one ordered and then to get it all set up. And so John texted me yesterday and said, hey, we, we, we're up and running. Like, oh, good. So thanks, John, for all that work this week. Well, uh, I just got a last second edit from my daughter. She said, don't say these things. But <laughs> it's... It's, it's too late, right? <laughs> I'm like, this is the third message into it, so uh, where were you when I needed you? Uh, the top 10 bad ideas for Mother's Day. This is by Tori Style, so I'll a little disclaimer. I, I didn't come up with these. Um, number 10, to mom who's always there without fail, could you send me money to make bail? <laughs> number nine, I know you didn't want a silly card or some flowers that'll die, so I got you a socket wrench set, which some moms would probably prefer over flowers. But uh, Number eight, for Mother's Day, I had a special dinner planned, but then I remembered you were on a diet. So I took my girlfriend and bought you some lottery tickets. <laughs> number seven, roses are red and violets blue. You're my mama, this is true. But now that the DNA test is done, 
It doesn't look like I'm dad's son. <laughs> yeah, that one could have come right out of the Bible. <laughs> we, we, we're we're going to look at a story today that's like, yeah, it's got some bad ideas in it. At number six, we're going out to eat like we used to. Dad's paying, and us kids are going to fuss and whine and order chicken nuggets. Number five, I got a tattoo that says, Mom, but I can't show you here in public. <laughs> Number four, look, Mommy, I made you a picture by gluing macaroni to a plate. That's sweet, Jeffrey, but you're 37, and the manager at Wendy's, I'm expecting a little bit more. <laughs> Number three, Mom, you said you always wanted to go on a cruise to the Bahamas. Me too. <laughs> Number two, I got you something online that I know you'll love, so you shouldn't mind that I used your card. <laughs> and number one, Mama, you know how you always say you love seeing us all around the dinner table? We'll be over at five. <laughs> it, th there's a lot of bad ideas that we can come up with in life. And today we're going to look at um, a bad idea that a mom had that affected um, two mothers and a father and two sons and just made a mess of things. And what we'll see is that God blesses these moms and this mess. And I think that's kind of encouraging for those of us that are prone to... Uh, get into messes. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 16. And we've been working our way through Genesis in a series called Pursuing the Promise. And this, uh, this promise was made to Abram and to his wife Sarai. It, it impacted her, but that, they, that God would make a nation through them if they would leave the place where they were living and go to this place, God would show them. He's going to make them a nation. He's going to bless um, Abram, and he's going to bless the whole world through Abram. And so it's very dependent on offspring, and there's been more promises about offspring. And just uh, in chapter 15, God said it's going to be, you know, your flesh and blood, Abram. And so the, the problem is that Sarai is barren, and it, it's a desperate situation. And sometimes um, some women, Mother's Day is their least favorite day, uh, because they're in that desperate situation. It's like, what do you do? And so this is what Sarai chooses to do. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Uh, this sounds very strange to us. Uh, it, it was legally done sometimes. It wasn't the norm, obviously, but, you know, we have different words that we use for uh, arrangements. We talk about uh, uh, a surrogate mother, and that's kind of been something that's been pushed aside somewhat now, and maybe a gestational carrier uh, would be a word used, and it, it's not something that people just go-to first choice, but it's like these are options when people are desperate. And this was not God's plan for how God was going to bless them. That's what becomes clear in this text. It wasn't God's plan. It, it really didn't end up being a, a good idea. It was a bad idea, but uh, she had it, and, and she's nowhere condemned in the scripture for having this bad idea. You, you just see that the bad idea brings consequences. And bad ideas don't get better. Bad situations don't get better by going along with bad ideas. And Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So Abraham went along with it, and that, that, that didn't help. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And so I... I don't know if we can blame Hagar for going along with this, because I'm not sure how much agency Hagar had in, in this whole deal, but everybody um, went along with it, and it, it just led to a bad situation. 
And sometimes we can be tempted to go along with bad ideas. Like sometimes we're the, the people that have the bad ideas, and you know that just happens. But uh, if you know something's a bad idea, don't go along to get along. Like no, you should say, hey, that, that, that's not a good idea. And sometimes we do go along to get along, and, and it just makes a bad situation worse. Jerry Harvey, in a 1974 article on the Abilene Paradox, he was talking about management of organizations and how some, sometimes we can agree for all the wrong things. And he, it's called the Abilene Paradox because it, it comes from the story he wrote in, in his book. And this story seems like it could be like a Mother's Day story. But on a hot afternoon visiting in Coleman, Texas, the family's comfortably playing dominoes on a porch. So it seems like more like a 70s story. I don't know if people play dominoes anymore. Until the father-in-law suggests that they take a 50-mile trip to Abilene for dinner. And the wife says, sounds like a great idea. The husband, despite having reservations because the drive is long and hot, there's no air conditioning, obviously, thinks that his preferences must be out of step with the group. And so he says, sounds good to me. I just hope your mother wants to go, you know, hoping that his, his mother-in-law will be the one that won't want to go. But the mother-in-law says, of course I want to go. I haven't been to Abilene in a long time. And so they all load up, and the drive is hot, and it is dusty. And when they arrive at the cafeteria, the food is as bad as the drive. And, and then they get in the car and drive back, and four hours later, they're just exhausted. And one of them dishonestly says, and how often do we do this, you know, it was a great trip, wasn't it? And the mother-in-law, with a little more honesty, says, actually, I would have rather stayed home. But I went along since the others of you three, you were so enthusiastic about it. And the husband says, I wasn't delighted to be doing this. I was only doing it to satisfy the rest of you. And then the wife says, I just went along to keep everybody happy. And the father-in-law, who suggested the thing, the first says, I just thought everybody looked bored, so I threw it out. I didn't really want to do it. Yeah, it, it, we get into big messes by just going along with bad ideas. And, and the world has lots of bad ideas for us. We've got our own bad ideas, and, and we don't want to do that. But they did it. They, they got into bad ideas. And the only thing worse than going along with a bad idea is after you've gone along with the bad idea to behave badly about it. And that's what these people do. Hagar, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And so that's not good. That's never going to lead to uh, good outcomes. And so that's Hagar's bad behavior, is that she now exercises some agency. I could do something in this situation. I could hate you, and I'm going to do that. And then Sarai said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Like, this is a different culture in a different time, but if, if your wife ever says to you, may the Lord judge between me and you and me, it's like, that's probably a bad day for you. And, and Abraham's having a, a bad day, like, and he's kind of like, got to be thinking, what? You know? Like, you're responsible for this. Wait a second, like, this was your idea. Like, don't go there. That's not going to get you out. Like, you agreed to it. It's now your idea, too. You know, you should have said no, but you didn't. And, and so A Abraham's, uh, you know, acquiescing to this. Sarai's acting up, and everything's going badly. And so then Abraham makes a bad decision here, too. It says, your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. And uh, Sarah's not thinking best thoughts right now. She's not thinking good thoughts at all about Hagar. So then Sarai mistreated Hagar, and I'm guessing it was pretty severe, uh, to the point that Hagar fled from her. And in the midst of all this brokenness, in, in this mess, in this family that's uh, all messed up, and you know, a lot of our families are all messed up. Like, there's an ideal out there, but we don't live up to the ideal. Sometimes we sanitize scripture, and that, that is not good. And then the other extreme is that we, we just don't acknowledge God at, at all, that he has a place. And we need to realize, no, life is messy, scripture's messy, and God is working in this messy world. And he's blessing people in this messy world because that's the only place he has to work. And he's blessing us 
in spite of our bad decisions, our bad ideas, our bad behavior. And so God gets to work blessing here. Hagar's on the run. And it says in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. Uh, the angel of the Lord is used a few times in Scripture. Sometimes it'll say an angel of the Lord, and that could be any angel, right? Because all the angels are the Lord's angels. But, but this one, it's a definite article, the angel of the Lord. And this is a particular angel that is the representation of, of the Lord in, in a bodily form. So this, some kind of manifestation of the Lord himself. And, and I believe, some dispute on this, but I believe that the angel of the Lord is Jesus, you know, before he was incarnated as a man, before he came to earth as Mary's son, that, that, that sometimes he showed himself as the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord. And so that's why I say in this next point, Jesus seeks out mothers and others in bad situations because of bad ideas and bad behaviors. And it says the Lord, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. That, that means he was looking for her. You know, he, he's seeking her out. And, and Hagar is somebody that has no standing in society. Hagar is not like a player, right? She, she's somebody that you just send her away, and who cares about Hagar? And maybe that's how you feel. Maybe you feel like, well, I'm, I'm not a player. Like, I'm not getting a lot of awards at graduation. Nobody's looking out for me. Nobody's paying attention to me. Nobody's asking me, you know, what decisions should be made. And, and uh, maybe, you know, because you feel that way, you're on the run and you've done some things that, boy, you, just, you know aren't right. Or people have done things to you that you know aren't right and you're, the, you know, bearing the consequences of those. But, but you need to know that Jesus is seeking you out. He's seeking you out. And, and he calls her by name. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? What a great question. I mean, a couple of questions, you know. Where have you come from? Like, but where, where has life brought you from? Like, what, what are the things that have driven you to this desperation, to, to this spot in life? And, and what are your plans for the future? You know, where are you going? She doesn't know. She knows where she came from. She doesn't know where she's going. And Jesus seeks us out. And, and sometimes when he seeks us out, we could be tempted to ignore him, to blow him off, not to acknowledge him. Or, or we can be tempted to kind of sugarcoat stuff and, and not really be honest about who we are, where we're from, what's happening. But I appreciate Hagar. She's very honest. And she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. She answered, now, this is not the right thing to do. But this is what she's doing, and she just owns it. Like, this is what I'm doing. I'm running away. And Jesus seeks us out when we're on the run. And then Jesus commands mothers and others to repent from bad behavior and promises to redeem bad situations. And so he does that here for Hagar. He says, then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. That, that's the command. Hey, re repent. You, you're, you're running away. Turn the other direction. Turn around and go back. Go face this situation. And, and by the way, Hagar, you know, you weren't completely innocent in this situation. You're not the only guilty party. And oftentimes that's the case. Like, you know, there's a lot of people to blame, but she's part of the blame. And so the angel of the Lord says, you own your blame. Like, you go behave better. Get back there and behave better. And th that's not an easy thing to do, but that's what she's called to do. Return and submit to her. And then in doing that, there's this promise of blessing. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Jesus was uh, looking for Zechariah, 
get the right name here, Zacchaeus, in the tree, Luke 19, in there, but he's looking for Zacchaeus, and he calls him my name. Zacchaeus, again, is people that other people are just muttering about. Like, he's a mutter name. You know, you talk about him, like, what's going on in the town? But, but Jesus calls him out by name, goes to his house, and he's eating. Then Zacchaeus feels convicted. Like, he knows he's a tax collector. He's ripped off people. He's done things he's not supposed to do. And he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to change. You know, I'm going to pay back the people that I ripped off, and I'm going to pay them back four times. Why? That's what the law required. And so I'm going to acknowledge the Lord in my life. I'm going to acknowledge the Lord with my wealth. I'm going to, I'm going to do these things. And Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. Uh, when, when we turn back, you know, when we trust in what God has done for us and we turn back uh, to God, that that's when he brings salvation. And Jesus is, is reaching out to us while we're sinners, you know, but God demonstrates his love for us since while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And so we're in the midst of our mess, and he reaches out to us, and he tells us, hey, turn from that. Turn from that mess. Turn back to me. And when we do turn, when we move back to him, then he's like, now I can work. Now I can redeem this. And, and that's the way we signal that, uh, that, that we're serious about following this God. And Jesus saves mothers and others who acknowledge and submit to the God who sees them. And she's going to do that. Hagar's going to do that. And uh, Zacchaeus did that. The angel had this blessing. I'll increase your descendants so much they will be too numerous to count. That's the good news. And then it's like a little bit tough news here. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant. You will give birth to a son. That also is good news. No ultrasounds in those days. And so it's like, oh, this baby's going to be a boy. Great. And your name, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. That's good news. And then it's a little bit painful. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. It, it's a blessing that God doesn't tell all of us what the personalities of our kids will be uh, before they're born. But, uh, you know, this, this one, they got, they got the whole layout. Like, oh, that's the kind of kid. Like, yeah, that's great, you know. You get a lot of uh, time in the principal's office. Um, but she went back. And, and she went back because she realized there's somebody paying attention to her. There's somebody that sees her. There's somebody that knows what's going on. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So the spring that she was by is named after this God who sees her. And, you know, that's what Zacchaeus, that's what changed him, is he realized that God sees him, like God noticed him, God called him out. And, and sometimes you can feel it invisible. And that's one of the real challenges, I think, for moms, is that a lot of the work that mothers do is work that nobody notices like nobody pays attention nobody gives an award you know for this and that's hard but but god sees and, and i don't know where you are where you came from but god sees you and, and maybe you're where you are because of bad ideas and you're in a bad place but but god sees you and he invites you to step back and Jesus died so that you would step back, so you can be forgiven, and, and he'll redeem that situation. He can bring you out of the brokenness and make something of it. And so this wasn't, you know, what God intended. This isn't the way God was going to bless everybody through Abraham, but God can still bless. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Just a little bit on this. Some people are pretty hard on the scriptures because of the, the circumstances that they describe. And so they'd be like, oh, women in the Bible, they're just chattel. And uh, th th there's some tough circumstances in scripture. But I, I think when you see the interactions here between Sarai and Abraham, or Abram, it's like this isn't like two totally unequal people. Like she's got a say. She's an agent. She's a player. And, and Abram listens to her. Hagar, however, she was property. And she didn't have much of a say. And yet, we see that this boy is named Ishmael. And 
Abram named him Ishmael, but how did Abram know what to name him? It had to be because Hagar told him what the angel had told her, and so she gets the, the empowerment to name this son. And, and God works to help the oppressed, the, the broken, to, to empower them, and he does so in this situation, despite the fact that she had not behaved well. And God is reaching out to rich and poor people, to married and unmarried people, to planned and unplanned pregnancies, moral and immoral people. I mean, he's reaching out uh, to turn us back, to, to redeem this world, to redeem our bad situations. And, and when we turn back, that, that's when he works. And so, you know, today might be your day to, to turn back to him. Some of you, it, it was years ago already, you, you turned to him. Turning to him, following him, Letting him redeem situations doesn't mean that they're going to be easy days all the rest of the days. And so uh, Hagar's troubles are not over. I'd like to end with uh, jumping ahead to Genesis 21. And spoiler alert, you know, this Abraham and Sarah did have a baby. It, and so that's already happened. We're jumping past that. And this baby was weaned. We don't know how long it was weaned, you know, just like, takes people sometimes a long time to potty train their kids, sometimes less time. Like, you just don't, you don't judge people for that, right? Just be glad when the kids are potty trained. But uh, this baby's weaned at some point in time, and there's a big celebration for the weaning, and, and all the relatives are invited, and Abraham, you know, there's like open house, you know, like it's, it's the, the baby's weaned, and so everybody's there, and, and they're all um, partying and, and having this, this good time. And then Sarah sees out of the corner of her eye, she sees Ishmael, the son of Hagar, this slave woman. She sees him mocking her baby. It's like, that's it. So she goes, she's hot, you know, and she goes and talks to Abraham, and she says, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. I mean, what was a party is now tense and kind of uncomfortable situation. And she just lays it out there. And, and Abraham's burdened, because it's not her son, but it is his son. And, you know, what, what's he going to do with this? And so he's not, not, like, willing to go along with her as quickly this time. But God said to him, Do not be distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Which seems terrible. Like, God, what about Hagar? But he's got Hagar covered. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. And so God's going to bless this mess. And uh, early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. So I don't know if Hagar knew, like if Abraham told her that God told me he's going to bless you. And I don't know if he would, she would have heard that from him, if she would have really believed it. What she gets for all of her troubles and, and her son, you know, there's just one day's provisions. Here's your water, here's your food, what you can carry, you're gone. And she went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba, the wilderness territory. So it's a tough place to be. And when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. So we've got a single mom who life has not been good to, and she doesn't have anything for tomorrow. She, she doesn't see any hope for her future. She doesn't see any hope for her son, and uh, she's in a hopeless situation. And, and she, she turned back and listened to the Lord, and now she's in this hopeless situation and sometimes you can find yourself in hopeless situations. And I see people, sometimes there's people in this church that are like, man, I don't see where we're going to go. I don't see where the next step is for us. There's people outside this church all over the place that are they're in hopeless situations. And what they need to know is that God still sees them, that God still hears them, that God still cares about them. And that God's still doing his redeeming work. God heard the boy crying. 
And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? He doesn't even wait for an answer this time. Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And, and now she hears the, the promise. And, and how does God do that? Like, how does God take this hopeless situation and make this boy into a great nation? Like, one drink of water at a time. One day at a time. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water, so she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. It's like he just gave her enough for the next day. And, and he just kept doing that, evidently, because God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. Like, I don't know how he learned that skill. I don't know who taught him. I don't know if his mom taught him, if some stranger taught him, if he just figured it out on his own. But it, it, it wasn't just like a way to have fun. It wasn't just a way to sport. It was a way to make a living. Like, this was to keep you alive if you could hunt the game. And while he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. That should have been a man's job uh, to do, but there's no man in the picture here. So mom takes care of it, and the Lord comes along and fills this gap. And, and so this boy does become a nation, and we're going to see all his descendants. And uh, the, the Arab nation, it, it's descended from Ishmael. It, and God blessed him. He, he took care of him. But it, it seemed hopeless. And some of you might be in a place where like, you're hopeless right now. Like, I don't see what's, what's coming next. And you need to know that, that Jesus sees people in hopeless situations and his love does not end there. Uh, that's what Paul writes about in, in his letter to Rome in the, in the end of chapter 8. It's a beautiful uh, a chapter. And I think Paul had experienced it himself that, that, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. And then he lists the impossible situations, like neither famine, you know, that, that, that can't take you away. When there, there's no hope, there, there's new food, God still loves you. Or the sword, you know, when there's violence all around, or the war, or just some neighborhood, it seemed like they're a warring neighborhood. No, God has you there. That, that, all of these things, even when there's illness that's leading to death, or, you know, there is death and there's loss, God can redeem that. That's the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And so today, you know, whoever you are, wherever you are, you, you need to know that, that God is there for you. He sees you. He's listening to you. And he wants to redeem your situation. Let's pray. Lord, on this Mother's Day, I just want to pray for moms who are loaded down with guilt. And there's just so much of that to go around, Lord. There's plenty of guilt that they can bring on themselves. There's guilt that others can put on them. Sometimes for things they did that have caused pain. Sometimes just uh, false guilt, Lord. But I just pray that you would free moms up from that. That they would just uh, cast that off, Lord, to you. That they would ex receive your forgiveness, your care for them. And that they would be open to turning back to the work you have for them. Uh, I pray for moms that are discouraged, Lord. That they would know that you see them. That you care about them. And I pray for all those, Lord, that are feeling hopeless today about their life or their situation, whether they're an Ishmael or a Hagar, or whoever they might be, Lord, that you would just take care of them today, that your Holy Spirit might just prompt them to know you care for them and provide for them, see them through uh, to another day and redeem their situation, Lord. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you stand, I'll give you a benediction, and then we'll close our service. Have a hopeful Mother's Day. And may God bless you in whatever mess you may be in.
or whatever mess you may get into. In Jesus' name, amen.